Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Apocrypha Apocalypse. I'm Gary Machuda. We've been doing some long videos, so I thought it'd be nice to do a nice, short, pithy one. And also one that's very relevant because uh, I think it's ubiquitous throughout the web, in books, and in uh, everything in between, that whenever there is a case against the Deuteral canon, the so-called Apocrypha by Protestants, almost always there is included an argument from the Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria. And so what I want to do is take a quick look at that typical argument that's raised and debunk it. So this is going to be a fast one, folks. So hold on to your seats because the Apocrypha Apocalypse is about to begin. All right, who is Philo of Alexandria? Well, like I said, he's a Jewish teacher. He's a philosopher. He was a contemporary of Jesus, although he never knew Jesus. Jesus never mentions him. The New Testament never mentions Philo. Uh, we just recently did a video, John Wycliffe, in his translation, and we noted in his preface that some of the early church fathers actually thought that perhaps the Book of Wisdom was written by Philo. Some also believe that 4th Maccabees was written by Philo. So he's kind of an enigmatic figure in early Christianity. He wrote several books. Most of them are an allegorical approach to scripture. And we're going to look at the argument that's often made from Philo of Alexandria against the Deuterocan. Like I said, this is ubiquitous. You find it in all the shotgun blast type apologies against these books. And namely, uh, it's an argument from silence, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Want to give a couple of examples. One example comes from Norman Geisler in his article on the Apocrypha in the Baker's Encyclopedia of Christian apologetics. It's very short and pithy, but it pretty much encapsulates what you find throughout the internet. So I'm not picking on Norm Geisler. I know we've done several videos where I have picked on him for some bad research. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I think this is a good example of how pretty much everybody uses Philo. And he writes, quote, Philo, an Alexandrian Jewish teacher, 20 BC to 40 AD, quoted the Old Testament prolifically from virtually every canonical book. However, he never once quoted from the Apocrypha as inspired, unquote. Now, of all the different arguments that Dr. Geisler gives, this one is extremely pithy, and I think it's because you realize that this is really just an argument from silence. There is a common catchphrase, which I think is helpful that the absence of evidence is not evidence of an absence. It's certainly, if that's true, it's not evidence of a rejection. And that's how it's commonly made in the blogospheres on the internet and so on. That the fact that Philo of Alexandria did not quote from any deuterocanonical book shows that he rejected the deuterocanon. And people will pile on this in order to kind of mask the fact that they're appealing to an absence of evidence and trying to turn it into a rejection. For example, they'll say, well, he was from Alexandria, so he must have been familiar with the Deuterocanon because some Deuterocanonical books are said to have come from Alexandria. Moreover, he uses the Septuagint, and so if he has the Septuagint, uh, the fact that he doesn't quote from the Deuteral Canon is also very, very conspicuous. But probably the most uh, heavily emphasized point is the number of quotations. And you see that here in Geisler's quotation, where he says that he quoted from the Old Testament prolifically. Okay, so he made lots and lots and lots and lots of quotations. And he also quoted virtually every canonical book. Now, what he's trying to do is by emphasizing the amount of quotations, he's hoping that the reader will think that the silence in regards to the Deuteral canon is conspicuous, that there's something suspicious about it, that perhaps it's even evidence that he rejected 
the Diderot canon. In fact, in one uh, article, while I was researching typical arguments in my book, The Case for the Diderot Canon, and also 15 Myths, I ran across one where it says that the silence of Philo, Philo screams for an explanation. Okay. And I think really what is screaming is the evidence that's being uh, twisted to squeeze out the proverbial drop of blood, right? They want to turn nothing into something. So how do we answer that? Well, first, it's an argument from silence. Silence cuts both ways. Perhaps he did intentionally not quote the Deuterocanon because he didn't believe that they're inspired scripture. Maybe. However, it's just as likely that he didn't quote from the Deuterocanon because he just didn't have an opportunity to quote from the Deuterocanon. Or perhaps there's some other possibility. In other words, silence doesn't tell us anything. Yes, but what about the conspicuous evidence? What, what about all those quotations that he makes from virtually every canonical book? Doesn't that tell us something? Well, you know, the same kind of arguments used in terms of the New Testament, you'll hear this over and over again. New Testament never quotes from the Deuterocanon, canon, although it constantly quotes from the Old Testament. Some, I think uh, 250 quotations is usually the number that's thrown out there. Does that mean that it's a rejection of the Deuterocanon? canon? No, it just means that there's no quotations. But nevertheless, I should also note that it is possible for an argument from silence to be used as evidence. However, those are very, uh, very difficult to establish. In order to do this, you have to show that the author is stipulating all those things and only those things that satisfy a particular condition. And therefore, if a thing is not stipulated, then we could use that as evidence that it is not part of that condition. So if the person says, all these books and only these books are inspired scripture from whom I quote, and there's not a single quotation from the Deuterio Canon, then that would be proof that he rejected these books as part of scripture. But that's not the case here. In fact, I'm not sure how anybody could come up and with anything from Philo that would show that there was a conscious effort in every book that he wrote to quote only from the so-called canonical scriptures, because the word canon at this point was not used. It wasn't used for a couple hundred years later. Yes, but what about all these quotations that Geisler mentions? What about that he quotes from virtually all the canonical books? Doesn't that show some weight? Doesn't it make the absence of evidence conspicuous so that it screams out for an explanation? Well, I think we can meet this challenge simply by looking at what are these quotations from Philo and what do they tell us, okay? Now, it's true that Philo of Alexandria quotes an enormous amount of quotations from the Old Testament in his works. There are enormous amount of quotations. Uh, the number that I've seen put at it is about 2,050 quotations from the Old Testament in all the works of Philo of Alexandria. That's an enormous amount of quotations. However, if you look at where these quotations come from, I think you'll be surprised because 2,000 out of the 2,050 quotations from scripture come from the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch or the Torah. That means the remaining 50 quotations covers the whole of the prophets and the whole of the writings. In other words, if you want to put this in percentages, only about 2.439% of all of Philo's quotations comes from books outside of the Torah, the Pentateuch, those first five books. So is it surprising that he didn't quote from the Deuterio canon? I don't think so. In fact, it would be surprising if he quoted from virtually every book of the Old Testament. In fact, when you look, you find that Philo actually never quotes from the books of Ruth, Esther, 
Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. So there are several proto-canonical books that are also silent in Philo. And so someone could turn the tables and say, well, doesn't his silence on Esther scream for an explanation? After all, he quoted the Old Testament numerous times and from virtually all the canonical books. Doesn't it show that perhaps he rejected Esther or he rejected Ruth or he rejected Daniel? No, of course not. It just means that he simply didn't have an opportunity to use them. And if he didn't have an opportunity to use these books, there's no reason to suspect that he didn't also have an opportunity to use the other books. So once again, Philo of Alexandria, it's very prolific. It's out there. And I think even if you put aside the fact that it's an argument from silence and you actually look at the data, I think you find out that there's nothing surprising here. Philo of Alexandria was very Torah-centric. He rarely quotes from outside of the Torah. And so the fact that the Deuterocanon, along with several proto-canonical books are never quoted, simply doesn't say anything about the status of the canon in his day. So like I said, this is a short video, but nevertheless, I think it's helpful. By the way, if you liked it or you like any of the videos on the channel, please subscribe, give the thumbs up, like. Also ring the bell because we do also do live broadcasts as well. And those are a lot of fun, very informative. So thanks for watching. And until next time, take care. Bye-bye.